Welcome back everyone in YouTube land. This is your tinfoil hat economist coming back to you at the speed of light with episode number 29, Trade Wars or Class Wars, a new book by Michael Pettis and Michael Klein. There's been a little bit of delay in these tinfoil hat presentations. I had cataract surgery, have my new glasses, and I'm ready to go. So let's look at this new book, Trade Wars Are Class Wars, Michael Pettis. He's a professor of finance, Peking University. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. And Michael Klein is a Barron's uh, commentator. Uh, friends, this is the first book that discusses global trade in any way that makes sense and is not straitjacketed by ideology or clueless odes to so-called free markets and comparative advantage. Nor is it simple left-wingism and describes everything as a race to the bottom, although there are elements of that. So how do nations compete in global markets? The question is better put, how do multinationals compete in global markets? They compete, says Pettis, by working with government and the ultimate result of this is greater investment or a declining labor share of income. And this is most prominently seen in the heavy exporting nations of Germany and China, but it follows a model developed by Japan and seen all over the Far East. Government works with industry. They provide subsidies, maybe free rent on land, free utility hookups, free build-outs of infrastructure, uh, industrial parks, free training programs for workers, on and on, and a large fraction of GDP flows into investment or industry, and a smaller fraction, a depressed share by government edict, mandate, or rule, goes to labor, a reduced labor share of income. That's how nations and multinationals, more particularly multinationals, compete today by sourcing where labor is most repressed. So uh, a corollary to this is that the David Ricardo theory of comparative advantage is totally outdated and antiquated because comparative advantage is never found, well, rarely found inside of industry or due to the location of manufacturing, it is found in, in the, what is provided by government. Uh, so that's how comparative advantage works today. So we've seen the results of this. We see declining labor share of income, even in the United States. It's gone down by about 10% since the late 1970s. I'll leave a link in the description box to the FRED chart. That's St. Louis FRED chart that indicates the declining labor share of income has even come to the United States as U.S. industries, mostly unsuccessfully, try to compete in the global market. U.S.-based manufacturing industries try to compete in global markets. So what's, uh, there's some fallout to this, of course, is that Germany and Japan end up with an awful lot of money, trade surpluses, and they try to do something with it. Uh, they often invest it in the U.S., which uh, they buy property in the U.S., uh, Chinese in particular, which is how now, uh, story not often understood. If you uh, rent a room, stay at the Waldorf in New York City, you will actually be giving money to the Communist Party of China. That happened because a Chinese insurance company bought the Waldorf, went bankrupt, was taken over by the Chinese government, and now the Communist Party of China is a hotelier at the Waldorf in New York City. So how do we solve this problem of uh, businesses locating where labor share of income is repressed. Uh, Michael Pettis suggests we could tax capital inflows into the U.S. that would reduce the capital inflows and, and somewhat compel nations like Germany, Japan, Singapore, China, Korea, and so on, somewhat compel them to put that money back into their domestic economies uh, perhaps by raising labor share of income. Uh, 
very unlikely anybody will listen to our uh, pleas that they increase labor share of income. You can apply tariffs. Michael Pettis is a bit, uh, uh, does not support tariffs entirely, but he does admit that tariffs and other forms of trade intervention may indeed raise prices for consumers, but this is only one way, and often a minor way, in which these policies affect households. Depending on underlying conditions, they may also reduce well, in unemployment, that is, increase employment, cause wages to rise, and reduce the growth of debt. So uh, you've got a couple choices going forward if you ever want to solve these trade deficits that the U.S. incurs annually, building up huge debts, and building up uh, perhaps uh, bloated asset prices in the U.S. as foreign capital flows here and must find a home. You can try to tax capital inflows if you can find them, or you can put tariffs on imports, which I think was actually the right course being followed by, dare I say, Donald Trump, and probably just needs to be spread more across the board. But anyway, uh, take a look for this book, Trade Wars Are Class Wars, by Michael Pettis, Uni Yale University Press, and come back soon, I hope, to see uh, episode number 30 of the Tinfoil Hat Economist. So this is the Tinfoil Hat Economist, signing off at the speed of light and wishing all of you the best of the holiday season.